Welcome to the Talking Archive. My name is Josh Jacobs, and it's a privilege to be talking with Larry Kenny. He's a voiceover talent, radio disc jockey, and TV host. And Larry, thank you for uh, being with us today. My pleasure, Josh. Thanks for inviting me. And well, tell us about your background. Uh, you came from Illinois, and uh, what got you into uh, radio? Well, um, let me think back now. It's been a long time. It's been <laughs> 60 years. I, uh, I I took a radio class in high school. Uh, now this is a small town in the Midwest, and this is we're talking about 1963, I guess. Yeah, 63. But they they had actually we actually had a, a studio, a radio studio, a recording studio in the school, which I didn't realize it back then, but you know was very very unique. Mm-hmm. I don't think many big high schools in big cities back then had a recording, you know, radio studio. And it was brand new and state of the art. And we did a 10 minute radio show every day at lunchtime. Uh, we didn't have a transmitter, so we did it over phone lines on the local, you know, radio station. So, uh, I did that and I really, really liked it. At the time, I was, I was also professionally a, um, sports newspaper writer. I was, um, I was covering uh, high school basketball games and football games and things like that, you know. And that was when I was 14. Mm-hmm. And I was still doing it, as a matter of fact, when uh, the offer came to, uh, when I, I'm sorry, I was doing the show uh, from high school. Uh, and somebody from uh, the big radio station around there in Peoria heard me, I guess. And uh, gave me a call and said, I could come up and audition and if you want, you know, to be a DJ here on our station. It was the biggest station in, you know, in Peoria, Illinois. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was the, what we used to call the Top 40 station. You know, we played only the Top 40 hits. So anyway, I went up there and auditioned, and um, they liked me. And the minute, I, the minute I went on the air, they put me on the air the same day. I did the audition. The guy, the guy came in and said... Um, we love you, you're hired. And I said, when do I start? Taking like, you know, a week, two weeks. He said, uh, four o'clock. You're on the air. <laughs> <laughs> so I had what they call a baptism by fire. <laughs> but that's how I, that's, that's how I got the job. And I started there and I, I immediately, from the time that first time they, uh, the mic was open and I started talking, I, I knew this is what I wanted to do for a living. I thought it was going to be sports writer, you know, mm-hmm. but I knew I loved it. So, um, <clears throat> So I, I, I stayed there while I was going to high school for another two years and um, moved on to weekends. You know, they would put me on like Saturday nights and Sunday nights or Fridays and Saturdays. And then eventually, after about three years, um, um, I got my own show on regular disc jockey. And that's, that's, uh, that's how I got started. And uh, so that station was uh, WRIL 1290, correct? And, uh, Close. PR- Close, close. It was oh. W-I-R-L. Oh! Trans, transposed the uh, I and the R, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, W-I-R-L, the mighty 1290. <laughs> A lot of stations were mighty back then, weren't they? Oh, yeah, yeah. That was the era of, uh, you know, the big the big, uh, big voice DJs. And, uh, and I'm talking about being, when I say I was a disc jockey, I mean, when I say it was a DJ, the young kids today think they I used to play records in nightclubs, but that's not the case. It was a <laughs> DJ back then said for disc jockey, which I guess it still does. But but it just meant that you were on the radio playing records and making a fool of yourself. <laughs> Who were your broadcasting idols, both on radio and television growing up? Ah, jeez. Uh, good question. Well, uh, Johnny Carson was an idol of mine. I... I remember um, everybody loved him, of course, back in the uh, 60s and 70s. And I I remember watching him. And as I watched him, I would always have this feeling in the back of my mind that that's what I'm going to be doing doing with my life. I'm talking about when I was 10 years old, you know. Mm. Uh, Looking back, it was kind of a weird thing, but I always... I never sat there and thought I'm going to be doing that. Actually, it's just though it was just that 
in my mind, it, it was though it was it was predestined. Yeah, that's what I'll be doing. Oh. And here I am in a small town of twenty thousand people in the middle of Illinois. But oh, you know what? I think one of the reasons that that, uh, that Johnny Carson really hooked me is uh, I knew that he was from Nebraska, and so was Dick Cavett. As a matter of fact, back then, a, a lot of TV and radio people came from Nebraska, Iowa, Illinois, and the reason for it was back then. Uh, everybody back there had no dialect. Mm. You know what I'm saying? You didn't have a southern drawl or something like this, <laughs> or you didn't talk like a New Yorker. You know, certainly not uh, not Boston. <laughs> uh, so, and back then they wanted everybody to sound the same, you know, and look the same on TV anyway. So I knew that, I guess, and I figured, well, hell, if Johnny Carson could come out of a small town in Nebraska, yeah, maybe I can I can come out of a small town in Illinois. About that, I did. <laughs> my parents are from Illinois, by the way. Uh, really? Know. What town? Well, my mom's from Naperville, and my dad, yeah. Evanston. And Although my dad kind of went back and forth between Evanston and Southern California, like La Puente, because uh, my grandfather, my dad's dad, was uh, uh, did sales. And so he kind of like moved from you know California to Illinois and back and forth type of mm-hmm. uh, situation. But uh, my mom was... <clears throat> Well, she was actually Chicago itself the first 10 years, but then when she was 10, yeah. she moved to, to Naperville, and her brother, my uncle, still lives uh, in that very same house to this very day. No kidding. Yeah. I thought you were going to say my dad uh, traveled often from uh, Evanston to Naperville. <laughs> no. <laughs> Although that's how my parents met. My uh, mom was friends with my dad's cousin who lived in Naperville, and that's how they uh, actually... <laughs> <laughs> wow. became a couple they're all together but hey you know yeah <laughs> my yeah. sister and i were the results so that's uh <laughs> that was a good thing yeah. that's great <laughs> <laughs> and um now you after uh wirl you got a call from uh, top 40 station wbkw in buffalo how'd you get that uh how'd you get that uh job well, let me ask you first, how do you know about that? Because I didn't go to work there. Oh, uh, I think IMDB or um, uh, oh, okay. a Wikipedia, unfortunately. I know that's a bad thing to look at. I, I look at a bunch of sources trying to figure things out. And Well, here, here's the thing. You're, you're, you're spot on in a way because uh, you may have read a story that I told you know, back then. When I was in Peoria uh, on the radio, I got a call from... W, what'd you say it was? Because I've forgotten one. That's okay. WBKW. Yes, yes. In Buffalo, New York, mm-hmm. right? That's right. And uh, and the guy's name was, the, producer, the public, and the program director's name was, um, oh, I can't think of it now. Anyway, Jefferson Starr. Mm. And I had I had heard that name because I had read it in, in um, the magazine, radio magazine, you know. And um, I, I, anyway, he called me and said, "How'd you like to come and work in Buffalo?" And I said, "Well, uh, uh, gee, that you know, that, that'd be nice, uh, but I have to wait till I get out of school." He said, "Well, you know, we got a lot of good colleges up here, man. We've got you know, such and such university." <laughs> and I said, "No, um, I'm sorry, I'm in high school." <laughs> and it was, it was a long, long pause, and the guy said. You're still in high school? I said, yeah, I got another year to go. <laughs> he said, holy Christ. Well, okay, man. Good, God bless you. He said, you know, when you when you finish high school, give me a call. I'm sure I'll still want to hire you. So that was kind of cool, I thought. <laughs> oh, yeah. But I, but I, I stayed in, at WIRO in Peoria uh, after, after high school, of course, and, and while I went to college at uh, Bradley University in Peoria. And then I moved to um, to Fort Wayne, Indiana, to a big t- uh, fifty thousand watt station, WOWO, and I was there a couple of years. And then I moved to um, Cleveland. Oh yeah, w- WKYC. And then I got a call from Chicago. Stayed there for a year. And then I got a call from New York. <laughs> <laughs> Which uh, station were you in sh- in Chicago? Uh, WJJD. It was a country station. Oh, okay. Country music. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I guess got a question for your first radio gig. Um, how much 
uh, leeway or how much free form or creativity did you have to break music? Because it used to be that DJs would oftentimes break new records on the air. How often did you get yeah. to do that? I never got to do that. Uh, I mean, this was a, remember, this is a little, uh, 5,000 watt station in a town of about 150,000 people. Uh, the, the only, the only stations that really broke records, uh, were the big, in the big cities. Mm. You know, I mean, if we broke a record in Peoria saying, Hey, here's the newest hot thing gang, we go, the only people in Peoria are going to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, uh, they did, the, the, the big, um, the record companies did not, did not I think, uh, give payola to the small radio station program directors. You know what payola was? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was a top 40 format, which I know you, you're aware of, but for people who aren't, uh, all we played was the top 40 records on the Billboard magazine top 100 chart. And occasionally throw in an oldie or something, you know, some oldies. But, but it was just those 40 records over and over throughout the day and night. And um, and they were a variety of music, in fact, uh, not just rock and roll, but middle of the road, country, some instrumental, yeah. some novelty, um, the gamut, you, you name it. They, you know, I remember um, there was a book that was written about KRL Radio, which was a top 40 station here in L.A., and uh, mm -hmm. They have oh, an air sure. check from 1966. He said, we heard the following songs in the order. We heard Got to Get You to My Life by the Beatles, followed by Strangers yeah. in the Night yeah. by Frank Sinatra, followed by the Phoenix Love Theme by the Brass Ring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what it was. Uh, we, we played what we, they used to call kind of soft top 40. Uh, I recall we did not play James Brown. Mm -hmm. We didn't even play the Rolling Stones because they were too... Wow. Wild and crazy. We <laughs> played the Beatles, of course, because you had to. Oh yeah. But um, but yeah, we we were kind of limited that way. We play, like you said, we would play uh, Beatles and maybe um, oh I don't I can't even think of a name. Temptations. No, play, uh... Yeah. Yes. Very good. Temptations. We played all yeah, all the Motown stuff, uh, but not James Brown because he was you know too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, about every song of his went that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're not even parodied him, you know, living in America is living with a hernia. I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's funny. <laughs> now, in, uh, in uh, Indiana at Fort Wayne, you went to uh, Group W Westinghouse, Whoa, Whoa Radio, 1190. Um, tell us about some of your favorite uh, memories there, because there were a lot of great uh, legendary DJs. Who did you, did you get to be closest with there at uh, Whoa, Whoa? Well, when I was at Whoa, Whoa, there weren't any really guys who became legendary, uh, except within that area, within that region. Now, it was a 50,000-watt station, mm. so we could, we could be heard. Um, oh, hell, we used to, I, used to get, I did the, the nighttime show. Uh, six to eleven at night, and um, we, I would get calls from uh, so, sailors on ships, just you know, uh, at, off England, mm. because because you know, signal skips over salt water. Oh yeah, you knew that. Uh, and now and I would I, I would get to lots of uh, calls and, and letters from people uh, down south, like in South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia places like that because it was 50,000 watts and, and uh, our audience was, was very vast. Yeah. And that, in fact, when you went to New York, um, were there any listeners to, you went to WHN 1050 in 73. Yeah. Uh, were there any listeners to WHN that called you up and said, Hey, I remember you on Whoa, Whoa. Oh yeah, sure. Sure. There were. Yeah. Um, uh, and then I also got that in Cleveland when I went to Cleveland because, you know, it's, it's the next state over in the, uh, in Ohio. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and started hearing from people from another state. And that was when I, when I first went to, um, to the uh, WoWo. And it's kind of freaked me out, you know, cause I hadn't thought about with that big, big 50,000 watt signal that it's going to be like, 20 times more people listening to you or, or who had the, the availability to listen to you. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, WKYC, was that more of a mainstream top 40 that would play James Brown and other uh, no. more contemporary artists? No, it was it was actually less top 40 than uh, WIRL had been and, and mm. WOWO had been. It was, I went to Cleveland in 70, 70 1970, I went to Cleveland. And uh, we were playing. I mean, we played Tom Jones, mm-hmm. who I just who I just saw the other night in concert. Wow! All these sixty years later, <laughs> and he was incredible, incredible. And he, believe it or not, he had, he remembered me. Wow! Because I, I introduced his show in in Fort Wayne, the concert, and I couldn't believe it. But I, <laughs> I you know, I walked up to him. He says, "Larry, did I?" Didn't I meet you, uh, you know, sixty years ago? <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm sure there are people who who give, you know give those guys uh, some background. You know, they, they check out who this guy's going to be, that's going to introduce you and all that. And maybe you might ask him about uh, Cleveland, you know. Or, uh, and he was probably the most gentlemanly gentleman I had ever met, and still is one of the one of the nicest guys I've ever met. That's I went. Uh, I went backstage before the concert, as I always did, to uh, meet with the with the act and ask them if there's anything uh, specific that they would like me to say in my introduction. Of, you know, mm-hmm. and um, uh, so I went back. His manager took me back. And the door opens to his dressing room, and there's Tom Jones standing there in a, a smoking jacket and an ascot. You know, he's got all this. <laughs> stage makeup on and stuff and he says Larry thank you so much for this and that and that come on in come come in and I go holy shit oh, I'm all part of my language I'm sorry <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and, and he said sit down would you like a drink and I did and after about two minutes he was asking me all about myself after about two minutes he said uh, oh, where's Shannon and I said Shannon he said your wife <laughs> <laughs> and I had forgotten what my wife's name was, but he, he knew. <laughs> I said, "Well, she's well, well Tom. She's 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 just outside the door. I wasn't going to bring my wife in there or anybody else. You know, take advantage of that situation." Mm-hmm. He goes, "Oh my God!" And he gets up and goes to the door and he says, "Sharon, who is Sharon? There she is. Come in." And I thought she was going to pass out. <laughs> he takes her by the arm, you know, and hugs her and kisses her on the cheek and. Sit her down right next to him. We spent another another good ten minutes just chatting. Wow! And uh, yeah, he he was he was incredible. There are people like that in the business, but not many. Wow! Anybody else you you can remember that was you know had that type of level like, of... like that? Kenny Rogers. Mm. Kenny Rogers. Well, I was still in Fort Wayne. Uh, this is probably about sixty nine, sixty eight, sixty nine. Uh, the same deal. I was. Uh, I was to introduce Kenny at uh, actually two concerts on a, on a Friday night and a Saturday afternoon. So we had dinner the Friday night together, you know, and then did the, the show the Saturday afternoon. And that was in 1969, I believe I said it was. Mm-hmm. Now, I, then I went to, to Cleveland, and in 1973, Kenny had become a country singer. He started putting out country music, and, and I was at a country station in New York, WHN. And uh, my boss said one day, he said, hey, uh, Kenny Rogers wants to come in and be on the show. I said, oh, great. You know, and, and, uh, acts you used to always, as they traveled around the country, they would go to radio stations and, you know, hype the show and everything. They would come in and interview with one of the disc jockeys. So I'm sitting there, and... Uh, I'm thinking, gosh, should I mention that we had met before? No, because, you know, he meets a thousand guys. And, mm-hmm. uh, this and that. The door opens, he comes in, he says, hey, man, how you doing? I, she says, we had a great time in Fort Wayne, didn't we? <laughs> I about <laughs> fell off my chair. I said, yeah, man. And we ended up going out for dinner afterwards, and uh, that's just the way he was. You know, there are some really great, Dolly Parton is the same way. Willie Nelson. Became good friends with Willie Nelson. My dad told me a and, great story about Willie Nelson, but yeah. uh, he says Willie Nelson, after a concert, he'll go to his trailer, smoke a joint, take a shower, get dressed, and when he gets dressed, he'll go out of the trailer and greet all the fans and will not go back oh, yeah. into his trailer until yeah. he's finished speaking with everyone. 
until the last person is left. That's right. This is the Talky Archive. I'm Josh Jacobs. We're talking with voiceover talent radio personality and host Larry Kenny. And next time, we'll find out even more of his favorite memories of Willie Nelson and Dolly Parton.